Hello, friends. And welcome back, welcome back, welcome back, welcome back to the Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I'm your host, Ron Knox, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, your friendly neighborhood monopoly crusher. Yo! And we did that thing this week. You know what I'm saying? It is Thursday, June 24th, 2021. It is absolutely wonderful to be hanging out with you all. Thank you so much for joining. Let's introduce our co-host for the evening. Hanging out tonight is ILSR's own Katie Keenbaum. Katie, what's up, buddy? Hey, how are you? Oh, man. I'm okay. <laughs> Yo, it Too is long. Great. Look, I just, let's just, I would like to start off by saying that I'm bone to my freaking core tired. It's been a wild week. It has been like, I don't know. It's like, I, like I talked about this a little bit like last week because last week was pretty crazy too. But this last week, like there are months and months and years in the world of like anti-monopoly policy and like fighting corporate power and whatever. There's a, there are months and years where nothing happens. And then there are weeks when every damn thing happens. And that's what happened this week. It was like, it was a lot. It was a lot, but I feel good, tired, but strong. You know what I'm saying? All right. It's better than the alternative, right? It's better Could have been worse. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, all right. We've got all kinds of things coming up. I don't know. I didn't have a, I didn't have a lot. There's the news was breaking. Breaking. Just as we, we don't have a tight nailed down script, so we're just going to play it by ear. We're going to, we're going to chit chat. Um, we're going to talk about news. We have major news. Uh, Five and six. Let's count them. Six. I said five last time, and then I think they tacked one on. Six bills have now officially passed out of the House Judiciary Committee, which is just one of the many committees of the U.S. House of Representatives. These bills would um, help to rein in and simplify the power of big tech, simplify some of these companies. Make them one thing and not a bunch of things. I think that's really helpful. Um, so that's really exciting for us. Major win for the anti-monopoly movement. We're stoked about it. Um, so now those bills are going to go on to the House. We're going to talk all about that. There is a major uh, uh, case, antitrust case, but also labor rights case, actually, in the Supreme Court this week that the court decided also in favor of uh, worker power and against, uh, and against monopoly power. We'll talk about that. Super exciting stuff. All kinds of little odds and ends. I don't know if we'll get to them, but we'll see. And we have a special guest, of course, this evening. He is a powerful crusader in the fight against monopoly power from the Action Center on Race and the Economy. The big homie, Maurice B.P. Weeks, is going to be joining us a little bit later on. Let's do the beer of the week. Beer of the week. I always go first. Katie, you go first. I go first all the time with this beer of the week. You do it. Okay. What, yeah, um, what are you as you we've got? established, I, I don't have a good intro for this, but um, I have, uh, I'm going to read from the can as I am <laughs> uh, looking at it. Uh, so I have a uh, Wallops Island American Brown Ale from- Wallops? Say it again. Walloped? Wallops? Wallops with an S. Okay. Wallops. I was like, walloped? Okay. Wallops. wallops. Right. Um, well, uh, more of a- currently walloping wallops <laughs> island uh from rocket frog brewing company in sterling virginia rocket frog is a great name for a brewing company i'll let them know i like yeah please send them an email for me no uh no it's a letter it's a let uh, that's a letter matter <laughs> <laughs> it needs to go on paper uh, it's serious <laughs> gotta uh, get some ink in there you gotta have yeah you gotta have your assistant take a letter and then and then someone gets a typewriter out um and that's independent right that's like it's got the whole the whole thing. Yep, I can find the little uh, little doodad oh, on here somewhere. It is a doodad, isn't it? All right, all right, love it, love to see it. You love to see it. You know the vibes. Um, here's the uh, here's I'm drinking. I was just talking about this before you went on. It's so like okay, ska revival, ska <laughs> revival has been talked about, bantered about for many many years, and me, Scott enjoyer. Is like, 
where's the where is it? revive it <laughs> let's go let's go let's make this happen and then Scott has never been revived but finally the year 2021 Ska has been revived. You know why? I decided, you know why? Because I because the, the, the pandemic is, we're lucky here in America. We're very, very lucky. And the pandemic here, for most folks, is winding down. And people want to party. And Ska is fucking party music. You know what I'm saying? I, so- I, I don't know. I think you're making too much out of, like, the youth wearing checker, you know? Okay, look, look. <laughs> I don't, I, I feel do like not... that's the, the, the most visible aspect of this that I've seen, but I... maybe I'm just not, not in that no, corner no, no, no. of the world. You're probably right. You're probably right. And as an elderly person, I literally don't know what's going on, but, um, but I read, a, I read an article. <laughs> Please kill me. <laughs> Was it covering TikTok no, trends? No. I read an article. that was like Sky Revival's back and I believed it. And I dabble in Fortnite, and I gotta say it earlier. There's now for this, the uh, like season season seven of Fortnite, the season we're in. There's an entire ska like theme and package with like a ska like a, like a ska character and a song. They like recorded, of course, because like like Epic is like a big thing and Fortnite's a big thing. So they like recorded an entire like studio quality ska punk song for the soundtrack with the horn player, by the way, from like. Uh, from Real Big Fish and Goldfinger. And so, like, anyway, blah, blah, blah. So, I, so I'm so i like, Scott's back. If it's, on, if it's on Fortnite and it's getting blasted into the brains of, like, like uh, all over the country and world, it's back. That's it. You're like, you can't, you can't deny it. So, anyway, in, so in celebration of Scott Revival Summer 2021, uh, I'm drinking a hazy IPA from Scott Brewing. Out of what? Call it Boulder, Colorado, Durango, Durango, Colorado. It won't focus on the camera. Oh well. Too hazy. Too hazy. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. And let me see. And it's got boop, 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 right there. You can barely even see it. Camera. God. One day we'll have real equipment instead of my phone. Anyway, uh, there's a little symbol. It's an up. It's an upside down beer bottle, uh, and it says it's the doodad. And it says independent craft. It's the doodad. Look for that whenever you buy your hops pops, uh, because it is the sign. But your beer is owned by a nice, uh, small or medium sized company, and not some terrible corporate conglomerate. It's like a, it's like a big beer factory with like black smoke coming out of the out of the stacks. You know what I mean? An old, old, old man money bag sitting on a pile of gold. Dumping sludge into the river. Dumping sludge into the river, making your beer. It's not that. Nice company. Nice small company. And then right here it says Lip Up Fatty. Which is, I believe, the best second wave ska song of all time. Okay. Very good. Let's do the news. What was it news this week? Let me ask you that. Let's talk about these. Let's talk about these bills. I spent, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. (laughs) That is dank. I've never had, I've never had this before. Woo. That's got all types of flavors. You are single-handedly going to bring back Ska. I feel it. Feel the enthusiasm. If not, if not me, this IPA is because this (laughs) is a stinky IPA. I really like it. Very good. All right. I, in the last 36 hours, this, this, the hero, the, (laughs) the hero that you're looking at blasted out 400 plus tweets about this about these bills, these house bills. And I did it because they're important and because I live tweeted this entire marathon hearing, mar- a markup hearing, that's not important, but it was a hearing of the members of the House Judiciary Committee that were considering these six bills that all together 
were intended to address the monopoly power of the four big tech companies. That's Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google. We know them. We know them. They dominate our lives. We, like, have to touch all their things all day long if you sit and work at a desk like I do. So they want to break up these companies. That's the idea. The idea is of these bills. And each bill does different things. But the crux of it and the most important bills do two things. One, they break up the companies. They simplify these companies by making them spin off their other, their other lines of business. So what is Google, right? What is Google to us? Google's a search engine. It's like where we, we, like, we like put in words and it spits out various websites and things and videos, whatever. What else? So that's, so that's Google's main thing. That's its platform, right? And then Google has all the other stuff that Google does. Google owns YouTube. Google has maps. Google does shopping. Google owns um, um, music, um, you know, property, Google Play. So it, it does all this other stuff. And the rub, the problem that's been identified it's been identified, by the way, this is, this is like stuff that, stuff that people have talked about for more than a decade and that Google has gotten in tr trouble for all over the world, except in the U.S., because our regulatory system has been um, intentionally broken over the last 40 plus years. So what Google does is use this platform. You search for like, I, I, I would like to watch a video. So you put the words into the bar in the search bar. And hit go. And what Google does is it it promotes its own stuff ahead of every other possible service out there in the world that does the same thing. So you're going to get YouTube results at the very, very top of your search. And because of, you know, human nature, everybody's busy. People are just looking for a thing. They're like, ah, YouTube's great. Click, 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 click. And then YouTube gets... Gets the traffic and the ad dollars and all the other things that go along with that. Plus Google, Google's like, ah, yes, we get that data and they get the data. When you click on something, it's a transaction. You're like, I'll click on this and hand you this, this like packet of data that you get to put in your pocket. So what, what makes um, that different from like, if you have a grocery store, like your local re regional grocery chain and they, they have their own um, house product, let's say Costco, like Costco putting its Kirkland brand somewhere prominent on yeah, its shelves. The idea is that if you, if you, if you live in a play, most places, some places have like little like monopolies. So, so that, so it would be problematic. You only, you know, if you're like a town with just a Walmart, then you got, then, then okay. The, the, like it's probably more of an apples to apples kind of comparison. But most places, you got a bunch of options. You can go to Costco. Okay. But you can also go to like a Sam's Club. Or if you don't need enormous sized um, items, you can go to like a, you know, regular, regular supermarket. And there, and there, and there are plenty of them. So there's all this competition. There's no dominance, you know, there's no dominance like that's really happening there. Now, now look, I'm going to take a step back. I, I, I don't want to get too far off, off, off course here, but I will say that, that like there is um, a lot of market power in the supermarket like world, right? I mean, Walmart is the, uh, is the dominant provider of um, food, of like supermarket goods in a bunch of places all over America. And that's problematic in and of itself. But, but Google, just to go back to that example, but Google controls 95% or more of, of uh, the online search market in America and in Europe and probably in most other places. That is, that's like dead ass dominance. You cannot get that's like the most right that's a monopoly without a doubt without having without by anyone's definition you know what i'm saying so that's what's going on and it's the same so with all these companies it's the same right i mean amazon 
Amazon controls 70 plus percent of all online sales, online retail sales for a lot of different product categories. Way more than, you know, 50 percent of all like product searches start on Amazon, not on Google or somewhere else. And one out of every two dollars or more spent online is spent on on Amazon.com. That's that's so upsetting. I hadn't heard that statistic before. Somehow, somehow missed that one. So you have all this. It is upsetting. It's, 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 it's <laughs> it sucks. It sucks. More more things to have nightmares about tonight. No doubt. So that's what's going on. So these bills are intended to separate these companies. This one bill, I should say, I'm sorry. This the main bill, the kind of like the the keystone bill in this package of legislation is intended to like put a wedge in there, put a crowbar in there and pop off some of these other, these other kind of side businesses that these companies have. So Google has its core search engine. Amazon has its big retail platform that all these other small businesses are forced to sell on because again, Amazon's got a monopoly on the eyeballs of shoppers, right? And so on, right? Apple is the dominant provider. It's one of two providers of like mobile operating systems and has a lot of market power and, you know, desktops and so on. And then Facebook, we know Facebook. Facebook is an absolute monopolist in social media. Um, you know, very much an illusion of choice company because you have face Instagram, and then you have WhatsApp and you have Messenger. These are all the same company. So the idea is to pop off some of these ancillary ancillary businesses so they don't have this conflict of interest. And and it um the effect of these bills if they pass would be seismic. Like truly seismic for the economy, for consumers, for workers, small businesses, for everyone that's has to rely on these companies to like function in the political economy of America. So it was a big deal. Plus there's another, like another bill would, would demand um, non-discrimination. It would stop these companies from discriminating either against other companies or discriminating in favor of its own like services, basically that and the, and the breakup bill go hand in hand hand like that. Uh, there was a bill that would stop a lot of mergers. There's a bill that would require the companies to let users, to let like you and me take our stuff, our shopping data, our, you know, photos and social media uh, info and data and move them from one platform to another. That sounds pretty good. Like phone number portability that we have. If now. there was another platform, but yes. If there was a, but, <laughs> yes, but this is, but yes, I mean exactly. Like nail on the head. There is no other platform because people can't do that. Once you give, once you like unlock that, once you like unlock those handcuffs on this data, and you let people take their stuff, all of a sudden there will be other places. You know. Well, and I, I think. And I think you already said, but like all of these different pieces kind of do rely on each other to really like meet their full potential, right? You know, just like having one bill pass, um, pass Congress would not would not have the same impact, obviously, as having all of these different pieces um, working together to try and, um, you know, break up these companies, make these companies actually compete in the marketplace. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Exactly. These are all interlocked. They're all they all rely on each other. And when taken as a whole, but particularly with the breakup piece, right? Particularly with that. But then with that as the as the as the keystone, and then the others as a whole, you have this really democratic reshaping of the economy in ways that will have vast benefits for most for like the ninety nine percent for like most folks. I don't whether you know whether you're just like a regular regular shopper online or somebody who like has to use Facebook to like look at photos of your niece and nephew or whatever, or whether you're a small business that relies on Amazon or whether you work in a, in a like an Amazon warehouse, you know, in California, like, you know, breaking your back. 
you would benefit. So there's a lot riding on these on these bills. So so what does the the path forward look like on those then? Well, so 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 the news, the news literally today, as of like two o'clock this afternoon, is that all of the bills have passed out of the House Judiciary Committee, and they're now heading to the floor of the House of Representatives where they'll get a debate and they'll and they'll get a vote at some point. And we think, by the way, Nancy Pelosi came out today and, think, you know, you can think of whatever you want on Nancy Pelosi. Not everyone's a big fan of her and her leadership, but she came out today and she really had a lot of good things to say about these bills and about the need to um, to deconcentrate, you know, the tech economy and the economy overall. So it's a hopeful sign, but boy, I mean, a hopeful sign that they're actually going to get to the floor of the House and we'll actually get a vote and then we'll see what happens after that. I mean, look, a mile... A mile to go, but but today was a reason to celebrate. I'm gonna put a uh, I'm gonna put a story up on the screen. Here we go. It's a nice New York Times roundup that came out today in a marathon session of debate. Okay, so by the way, so my 400 tweet. Let's get back to my four. I'm gonna talk about my 400. 400 are you, are you gonna tweets. read them all out for us? I thought about I, it. I might have missed a few. <laughs> I need a like a recap. It'd be called. It'd be like the anti-monopoly bedtime stories, yo. Like here, I want to. I want to like a (laughs) recap podcast for your tweets. Oh my god, you do not. You do not want this. And you have to have a have like a night shirt and one of those hats, one of those floppy hats, in bed reading those things. No, 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 I'm not going to do that. But the reason that I that I that I was tweeting because I was trying to live tweet this thing, and it went for with a break, so so people can get a little bit of sleep and eat a meal. It went for like 39 hours. Which is wild. And respect, by the way, respect to all those people, because they're older than me. <laughs> Most of them. And they just chugged right through, man. They were like, all, all, every single one of them was just eating a big old bag of M&Ms and like, and, and debating these bills. I'd like to know what their shopping list looked like. I don't know. Yeah, right? They all had crispy, they had like crispy shirts. They're like Don Draper just like pulled a Brooks Brothers shirt out of the out of his like desk drawer and put it on. All right. And so here's the story. In a marathon session of debate and voting that started Wednesday morning and continued into Thursday, the Judiciary Committee advanced the suite of bills, which are meant to weaken the dominance of big tech. It goes on bills to bulk up antitrust agencies, make it harder to acquire rivals. And so on. It's weird. I think the story is weird. I like the story. I mean, you know, New York Times says these good roundups. I think it's weird that it, it, it doesn't mention breakups. And the core bill, the one that was saved for today, saved for last because it was the most difficult. And the one that squeaked by 21 to 20 vote in favor was the breakup bill. It was the hardest one to do. And the story doesn't quite mention it. But but anyway, so that's a, so that's a little story from today. I'm going to play a quick video. This is Representative Jaya Paul, who's a hero. And she was the she was the main uh, she was the Democratic co-sponsor of the breakup bill. So this is her talking today. I just picked kind of it's a long clip, not gonna play the whole thing, but I picked a moment in this clip where she gets she gets hot about um the whole this whole delegation of uh representatives from California, three Democrats, two Republicans, but they were a block. They were a delegation as delegations often are, right? And they were like the number one roadblock to these bills passing. They were bad. I mean, they were bad actors. No, no, no. Like it was, it was like a nightmare to watch. Because they sat up there and they literally, word for word, just repeated. It was as if a tech lobbyist handed them a piece of paper and they said, I, I have something to say. And then they just read the piece of paper. I mean, that's more or less what happened. I was going to say, I'm not sure as if is the right word. Yeah, words yeah, yeah. To use there. I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not I'm not far. If that if that's not the exact truth, I am like one step away from um, from the actual truth because that's more or less a paraphrased a paraphrase yeah that's more or less how it went down so i just pulled up this video 
here on YouTube. I'm going to hit go. We're going to watch a minute of it. So this is Jayapal. So, so the backstory is that this, this delegation from California said that these bills were like throwing a grenade, a hand grenade, at the tech industry. And it was going to blow up the tech industry. So Jayapal steamed about this. She's not going to not going to freaking take anymore. Here she is. Um, and so for the people that think we're throwing a grenade, um, I would say to the grenade analogy, there have been a few analogies made here with grenades. I would say the grenade that is being thrown right now is being thrown at small businesses. I mean, we are not allowing the space for small businesses to compete and to thrive. And so to the colleagues on both sides of the aisle that are supportive of a strong tool, a hammer, if you will, in the toolbox, it allows for at least a push uh, that is very, very, a, a very, very real threat to break up these monopolies. And to the, those who are opposing it, I, I have been stunned to just listen to all of the support for big tech, big tech, big tech. And I get it. I've got big tech in my district. I am grateful for the things that they do. I am grateful for the jobs that are provided. But why are we not talking about small businesses in this country? Why are we not talking about small businesses? For those who are opposing this bill on both sides of the aisle, you want to fight for big tech? Let me read you some of the things that we have gotten on this bill, not just from Democrats, not from Democratic districts, from Republicans, independents, and people across districts. So, and then she goes on to read some really helpful comments. Snell 2041, we should make a zine. We should make a zine. I want to make a zine of those, of, oh, of the tweets or the comments? No, I'm not going to oh. make a zine of my tweets. What a nightmare that would be. No, Both. It has, it's multimedia. <laughs> yeah. Love a zine. I'm not, Get my I'm scissors not. out. <laughs> Blue sticks. Oh, man. How many late nights have I spent it? A Kinko's <laughs> making some kind of zine. And she pulls out these comments from from um, all these small business owners from around the country, from North Carolina, from all these places. And, you know, and these small business owners are like, we can't, we literally cannot survive in a world in which we're held under the thumb of these tech monopolists who get to decide when we do business, how we do business, how much we got to pay to do business, how much we, you know, how much we have to pay them, by the way, to do business. When and how we can contact our customers, all these other things. We just can't do it. So Jayapal got steamed about this California delegation. And, you know, there's just this, and it, and it's, and of course, I'm now, I, you know, I'm steamed too. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't be, like angrier. Put that energy into the zine. <laughs> need passion. You do need passion to make a zine. Snell twenty forty one says, "Make a vision board." I'm gonna make a vision board. I am. I'm. A, I. I got the vision board, baby. Right in the noodle. All right. And then so 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 here's the thing. So these so the so these arguments that. That um, the California delegation and the and by proxy the tech lobbyists are making are literally arguments to me. I I see these arguments. I hear these arguments. And I'm like, oh, that's literally an argument in favor of breaking these companies up. You don't know what you're saying. The implications of what these people are saying are so wild and are so like derogatory. By the way towards small businesses and work working people again breaking their back in the inland empire and southern california and all over trying to like you know trying to to meet these pick rates and catching covid and doing you know and doing everything else i mean look you know like they there's no there's no rational argument for for keeping these companies together I'm going to show you, I'm going to go to a, I'm going to go to a screen grab here. I was so steamed. 
Representative Lou Correa, who represents Southern California. Real quick, by the way, uh, like before I get into this, I want to go back. I want to go back to. I want to go back to the homie Jayapal, who's amazing. And by the way, she is the representative from Seattle. Like Amazon is in her backyard. The the onions, bro. The onions. To take on, to be like, yeah, I know you're right there, but we're going at, but here we go. We're going at it. I'm going to break you up. And this is literally, it's her bill. Maximum respect. It doesn't, uh, seriously. In the world of representative politics, like it or don't like it, it rarely gets better than, than someone like that. All right, let's talk about Correa. On the other hand, on the other hand, let's talk about Lou Correa. So here's a statement. I'm gonna, I gotta switch up the screen here. Screen, screen share. Beep beep. I'll read it. I'll, I'll read it out for people who don't, who are too lazy to read the screen themselves. In my district, this is a statement that he gave. In my district, small business. Wait, 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 wait. wait. Huh. Sorry, are you doing your Luke Carrera, <laughs> Carrera voice? No, or are you I'm just, doing like, my, doing I'm doing my, I'm doing my. Okay. Like, when I'm, when I'm, when I'm saying a corny thing, this is that. Voice. Okay. I just wanted to. <clears throat> no, know where we were standing here no, thank you for clarifying i do appreciate that in my i should have i know they need like subtitles or some kind of caption in my district small businesses depend on services provided by the tech companies small businesses depend on services provided by the tech companies amazon has opened a distribution center and is looking to open a few more these are good paying jobs with benefits. So let me tell you something. I like, look, <laughs> I don't want to spend too much time on this because I, because I could, and I, and I, and I want to, we need to move on. I want to talk to, I want to talk to, to my guy, Maurice. I do. I'll make two points. I'll make two quick points. When you say that small businesses depend, the small businesses is, is in this district depend on services provided by those tech companies, as if that is a reason to keep those tech companies, when in fact, in actuality, it is literally the opposite of that. It is a reason to break the power of these companies so that small businesses don't have to depend on some benevolent corporate dictator to benevolent. like benevolent quote unquote benevolent or not benevolent right that's the thing the unaccountable unaccountable corporate dictator to let them either make an, you know a living have a livelihood or not in korea's world that decision is up to amazon not up to the small businesses, not up to any other kind of democratic forces. It's up to Amazon. And that's well, it's also, it's just a failure of imagination too, right? Like see, refusing to try and see what it could look like without Amazon or without Amazon at the, the level of power that it has currently. And probably more to the point, a failure of him actually talking to his constituents and talking to small business. Because they'll tell you. That's the thing. They'll tell you. We talked to small business. Two years, we did a nationwide survey of small businesses two years ago. 75% said that Amazon, they said, what's the biggest threat to your business? And they said Amazon.com. Not that, not that, oh, we're so happy to have to rely on this marketplace in this, in this company that bundles its products and forces us to buy its shipping and warehousing and forces us to buy its ads and do all this other. No, no. They said there's a number one threat to their business. Only 11% of those small businesses that we talked to said that they've had a good experience when they've had to sell on the Amazon marketplace, that it's been positive for their business. 11%. It's not very much. So that's one problem. And then the jobs thing, bro. 
That's what always gets me. I mean, it's crazy. There was just a story. By the way, there's just a story in the Los Angeles Times that can get thrown on to Representative Correa's doorstep if he wants it in his home district about workers desperate for work getting funneled into Amazon warehouses and then catching COVID, dying suffering injuries all kinds of trauma these places these places are the worst places to work in the country they're not i don't mean i don't mean they're among the worst places to work in the country they're right up there with like working meat packing doing agricultural work and so on they're right up there they're so dangerous the state of washington had to create an entire new like osha regulation like whole category for Amazon, Amazon warehouse workers, because it was so dangerous. And I think, you know, it always, I mean, there's tons of, I, like, I can't go anywhere online now and not get um, bombarded by Amazon advertisements, um, you know, promoting their good wages. Um, but even if we like took that, even if we accepted that these are good jobs, good paying jobs, um, and that didn't have all these other like, you know, health safety issues, um, you know, that's not necessarily like a, that's more of an indictment of our labor market and, <laughs> you know, our, our current wages than, uh, you know, a, um, a bonus point for Amazon, right? Uh, like that, the, the way you address that isn't just by giving Amazon anything it wants because it um, offers $15 an hour jobs. I agree. I agree completely. I agree completely dollars an hour is a poverty wage for a family of four so let's get real about that let's get real about what 15 dollars an hour is this shouldn't even be the start of the conversation in the year 2021 we talk about a living wage versus a thriving wage you could talk about a thriving wage but it's also backbreaking wildly dangerous work with an un like literally an unaccountable company driving that whole operation, okay? And in places like Inland Empire and elsewhere, when, when Amazon is the, is the biggest show in town, it's company town, they can get away with whatever they want because what are the workers going to do? That's monopoly power too. Move across the country. Move across the country. <laughs> away from all their family and friends and sport network. Sure, <laughs> Obviously. yeah. Yeah, this like, this like fiction of mobility. Bro, that's monopoly power too. By the way, that's monopoly power too. And so what? Ha so anyway, so so this is what I'm saying. So like, so there's just the disconnect in this thought of like these are good jobs. You know they're not good jobs. These Amazon warehouses move into. By the way, move into um, into Southern California in the Inland Empire. And now, now Black and Brown communities there suffer some of the worst pollution in the country with drastic like health impacts on their lives the kids have asthma you know because it's nothing but a stream of you know trucks amazon like forced san bernardino to put a whole air cargo um operation into their airport so now they're doing 20 flights a day out of that right over rooftops, you know what I'm saying? Unaccountable. This is what I'm saying. Like, unaccountable because leaders like that are so, are so obsessed with the jobs, even though they're terrible jobs. So what happens? So you break up Amazon. You say, okay, you can have the platform, all right, but you can't have this logistics company. And you can't force all of the sellers on your platform to use this logistics company or else they don't get the prime badge. They get buried in the algorithm. They, they, you know, all the stuff. But then what happens? Then you can have, look, I'm not, I, you know, there are other, there has to be a suite of solutions to things, including worker power, collectivization of worker power and all these other things. But once you separate this company, you say, okay, now this logistics company has to compete 
head to head with other companies for in all the ways that companies compete with you know with each other right ups are union jobs usps are union jobs you know what i mean and you can have you can have better workplace protections you can have health and safety protections you can have higher wages you can have all these things without having to just suffer through whatever Amazon's going to give you. You know what I mean? And city leaders can have a choice. They can say, unless you offer us some assurances that you're not going to, that you're not going to, you know, pollute the air and water all around where, you know, where you're operating, where people have to live, then you can't come in here. You can't come in here or we're not going to, you know, we're not gonna. We're not gonna make a nice uh, soft landing for you to come in here. And this stuff seems obvious to me, but I don't know, man. You end up with these. And the bottom line, let's just get real, real talk. But the bottom line is, they say it's about the jobs. They say it's about the jobs. But then you look, you you know, follow the money. Who gives to their campaigns? Who who? How does you know? So there you go. So there you go. But the good news, I don't mean to get down. The good news is that these bills all passed. They all passed despite the California delegation's objections and, you know, bad faith amendments and everything else. They tried to jam in there. And off they go. I don't know, Katie, what do you think? Anything else you want to move on? Oh, I mean, I hope they continue to go, right? I mean, it's a long road. It is a long road. That is that is no doubt. But this is a good start. It was a good start. And by the way, I want to just say, you know, take it for whatever it's worth, but there, is, there was um, a lot of different interesting kinds of people came together to make this happen in the, um, in the judiciary committee from different parties and different perspectives, but a lot of concern about corporate power out there. That's good. Yeah. Heart. It's like heartening. It's, it's, you know, do you think it's going to get a different re like, I guess, reception or has it um, gotten a different reception with uh, representatives outside of the committee or, like, <laughs> is it going to be less bipartisan in um, the big wide open sea? Or is it, do you think there's a lot of hope still and a lot of um, bipartisan support? It is an absolutely good question. I don't know. I literally don't know. I guess we'll find out. I guess we'll find out. For episode 16. Oh, boy. Who knows? Who knows? God, do you want to even talk about the Supreme Court? It's 645. I, I want to hear from Maurice. I want to hear from Maurice, too. Forget the rest of the news. The Supreme Court. I'll give There's you, no other news. <laughs> I'll give you a two. Here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll give you a two minute version of it. The United States Supreme Court uh, this week. Ruled against the NCAA. The National, what is it? National Collegiate Athletics Association. That's what it is. Yeah, sure. <laughs> they couldn't. Um, they couldn't deny their college athletes, student athletes, essentially a penance, some little amount of money, scholarships, additional benefits. Um, for playing, you know, for playing college basketball and literally being the engine that drives this multi-billion dollar uh, like industry that is that is college sports in America. The U.S. Supreme Court in a unanimous vote, by the way, unanimous vote. And the fascinating part of this, I won't go too much into it. It's important for labor law because basically what the Supreme Court said was you cannot deny these workers the 
wages and benefits that they would that they would get in an otherwise competitive market. Essentially saying the NCAA is not a competitive market. It's some kind of weird hybrid monopoly cartel situation. And that and that and that like all the various teams and conferences and the NCAA as a whole have essentially conspired to not pay their laborers for their work. So the justices did their best. You read the you read the majority, you read the opinion. It's not like it's just a majority opinion. Unanimous, you know, unanimous decision. So you read the opinion. And the justices, all the conservative justices, who, who, as we all know, now dominate the court. They did their best to try to pin this to like this very neoliberal, um, hyper conservative reading of what the antitrust laws are supposed to do. The jargon, the jargony term for it is consumer welfare standard. But that just means they, you know, they tried to pin it on this very narrow reading of the antitrust laws where everything is about efficiencies and about price and about, you know, about consumer prices and about output and all these things. They tried. They did their best. Boy, you look at their citations and it's like, uh, who's who of the greatest conservative jurists of the last 60 years, right? Antitrust jurists, I should say. But it is. But then their decision comes out and it's literally a total reframing of antitrust law. In every way, because it's saying because under the under the actual consumer welfare standard, you say all that matters is court said was that's not all that matters. How you pay for your how, as a buyer of things and the NCAA in this in this instance is a buyer of labor. I said as a buyer of things. You also have to be pro-competitive and you also have to not conspire amongst yourselves. You have to not flex your enormous power. And the NCAA, of course, has not literally monopoly power as a buyer. There's no other avenue for, you know, major collegiate athletics. And he said, you got to do it. You got to pay. So that's it. That's I mean, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go too much more into it, but. But suffice to say, it was a massive decision. It will have significant repercussions on down the road, both for the NCAA. I think the I think like amateurism in college athletics is the fuck out the door, man. I think that's over, 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 over. Is it good? Those the the young men and women of um, who play college sports should get paid for their time and their labor, just like everybody else. But it has major, major repercussions for antitrust law as well. That's it. Forget story time. Let's talk to our special guest, our guest of the night. Let me get my whole. I'm get my. Uh, I got a whole intro here. I don't want to mess it up. He is the co-director of Acre, the Action Center on Race and the Economy. He's an organizer. He is a campaigner. He is an activist. He's a warrior every single day, every time we've ever talked for for in favor of racial and economic justice in America and against monopoly power, corporate power, surveillance capitalism, all these other terrible things. One of the most passionate anti-monopolists I know. Folks, boys and girls, ladies and and gentle Dems, Maurice BP Weeks. Hey. What's going on, buddy? Thanks for having me. Oh, this is fun. Thanks for coming. Thanks for hanging out. I'm sorry you had to listen to me rant. Oh my god. I feel like every every guest is like, come on to the happy hour. Torture for 45 minutes. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> I've I've got my uh Cerveza Del Rey here um from uh Brew Detroit. So also you see the independent logo there. So I was just sipping on that listening to to you too. No problem at all. Lovely. Cerveza Del Rey, tell me about is it a is it like um is it a is it a Mexican style lager? Is yeah, this, this is, is a Mexican lager. Um, so yeah, I just I, I've I I used to be into like really 
uh, high alcohol, hoppy IPA beers. And I don't know if I'm just, it's probably just I'm getting old. But now if I drink one of those, I'm hungover for like four days. Oh, so oh, no. I've, I've shifted to the, to the like very drinkable, usually much cheaper uh, beers. And this one's delicious. Love it. Love it. You do. You do hate to see it. These bro, these, the like hangover all of a sudden, like when I was like 10 years ago, I'd crush a million beers. Like it was nothing. Now I'm like, yeah, no, yeah. it's, and it's pretty sleep. wild. I have to sleep yeah. in. Oh. Yeah. 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 Uh, all right. Let's talk. And let's look, let's talk about the, um, the big news. Hard to avoid. Let's talk about the legislation that got out of the um, judiciary committee last, yeah. last night. And then today, um, obviously Aker was involved, uh, in, uh, in working on this legislation, pushing for the legislation and tell me a little bit about your role and, um, your reaction to, uh, all of these bills getting through the, uh, the committee more or less unscathed. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we're involved just as a member of Athena, which is the coalition to take on Amazon and, I'm I'm pretty happy right now. This is a celebratory beer that I'm drinking. Like there, uh, you know, I feel like with Congress these days, you like expect the absolute worst and are are like pleased with something that's just bad. But this was actually this was good, you know, like getting these bills through. And of course, there's some things that we could like clean up around the edges. Like if we, you know, if it was just Acre who was running the judiciary committee and not the. the, the um, but yeah, I think this sets us up for some some really good fights over the next little while here um, around anti-monopoly, specifically trying to take down. Yeah, what's I mean, but let like unpack that like a little bit. What do you think the fight's going to be like? Where do you think the like battle lines are going to be drawn? I thought, and I asked that because I thought, uh, you know, it's not lost on anybody, right? That the coalition that came together, not the not not the Athena coalition, the coalition in Congress that came together to actually pass these bills was weird. Yeah. And yeah. maybe some, maybe for a, like unsettling at times. Yeah. Yeah. And like, and like people were kind of taken aback, but then, but then, it, but then it works. And here we are. What yeah. do you think? Like, what do you think the big fight? Yeah. I mean, that's, coming up? that's a trick. That's a tricky thing. And like the, you know, I, I think it's like, it's less weird in the house, honestly, than it is in the Senate. Like, I think we're going to see some really weird stuff when we get there. Like, um, you know, Senator Hawley, who like, you know, just saying his name makes me want to throw up. Um, but he like, is like, I could imagine him supporting all of these bills as they come through. Right. Um, and that's a little, that's, that's really disorienting for a lot of folks. Like, why does this guy who like is basically a fascist, um, uh, a fascist <laughs> in Nebraska, which is, I, it's just a funny thing to have, to be a fascist in Nebraska. Wait, but, who Holly? Yeah, who Holly? Yeah. Or Missouri, Bro, rather. Missouri, yeah. who, hello. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah, here. My, yeah. my neck of the woods. We have, yeah. um, we have the, uh, we have the dishonor of uh, of having the senator. Fascist in Missouri right really is just an interesting place to yep. be a fascist. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like you have like he supports a lot of the the stuff against monopolies. He has like super ulterior motives, right? Like of it's it's not the let's create a democratic economy where like people of color and poor folks can all thrive and work well. And like, no, that all that stuff is going to turn him immediately off. He's like, I don't want these woke tech companies telling me that I can't say the N word on Twitter. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not the same fight. So like, yeah, I think it's going to be important going forward, like to make sure that we're, um, you know, like distancing is maybe the wrong word because like, I think that ideally we don't, we, we focus on what we want. We don't focus on uh, jackasses like Josh Hawley. Um, but making it so like we are clear about where we stand on, on like racial injustice and how that uh, links up with monopoly issues. Um, and that kind of stuff might make the fights harder, honestly, like there's probably an easy path to get some monopoly stuff passed. If we just like, make a coalition with like essentially Nazis, but like, I don't want to be in a coalition with Nazis. Like we, we, you know, we owe it to our people to not do that. So 
yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. I couldn't look. I couldn't agree more. I think that the challenge, but the necessary challenge and the real, the necessary fight, um, whether it is with these bills or with the neck or with other bills that are broader focused and looking at the whole economy, because as you and me know, monopoly power courses through so many industries. So you got to address the whole thing, but you cannot address the whole thing without without like intertwining it, linking it directly to the need for racial equity and the need for racial justice and how the rise of corporate power and outsized corporate power um, has led to uh, so many of the of the inequities that you know that we see every day, particularly among workers, but also among communities who are fighting um, you know pollution and who are and who are um, you know fighting for their um, for for local control of their communities and small businesses and and you know keeping wealth uh, in the neighborhood and all those kinds of things. So. Yeah, totally. I mean, like we're in a we're in a time and place right now where we have an economy that is like run by these super uh, highly concentrated monopolies. We have an economy that is rapidly polluting the earth. We have an economy that is like paying workers poverty wages, like you say. And we have an economy that's making sure that like racial wealth and income gaps and systemic racism remain in place it would be silly to think that all of those things are not intertwined and that the economy is just independently, like there's like one part of it, part of the problem that's making it so that we're paying workers little. And then another problem over here that's making it so everything is racist. And then another problem over here that's making monopolies. It's the same system. You have to like take a whole approach to it or, um, or we're just going to end up with something that is different, but screws over a bunch of other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, exactly. Exactly. Long road ahead, my man. Long yeah, road ahead. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think you're right. The hardest fights are in front of us, but they're important and you got to do it. Um, so there are lots of ways to fight, though, right? Lots of ways to fight. Anti-monopoly is one thing. Labor rights is another thing. We've got the PRO Act out there talked about. Um, you know, general labor reform, strengthening unions, Reform tax policy, right? I think one way to get at some of this corporate power is to have a truly progressive tax. Actually, you know, make people pay their taxes, as we saw from that, you know, blockbuster ProPublica report. Yeah. These companies and their leaders don't pay their taxes. And so on. As you think about what's a good fight, what's an important fight, and ways to make the economy fairer, more just, more equitable... What's what what kind of bubbles to the top of that list for you? Like, how do you how do you think about this matrix of different tools that we have um, to make the system better? Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, I try not to separate them too often because like I feel like um, one thing that we often fall into um, and it's kind of the way that presidential administrations work, you know, is that like like, OK, we'll do the worker thing. And then we'll do the monopoly thing and then we'll do the whatever, you know, like the tax thing. Yeah, this is totally and, just like policy wonk weird framing. I mean, it is. It yeah. Is. I mean, like, I so I think generally like what we need to be moving towards is like we have corporations and uh, and individuals that just like have too many resources and too much power. So and there's tools to deal with that. Right. There's like. Uh, you know, blocks on uh, money and politics that we can put in place. There's, uh, you know, worker standards that make it so that you're not able to just like, you know, hoard wealth for the top executives like like nuts. Um, uh, and there's like obviously fixing the tax code. If anyone hasn't seen that ProPublica article, article yet, it's infuriating and just shows you all of the ways that we can fix the tax code to make it so that, you know, we don't have these Bezos is who just, you know, can accumulate all this wealth uh, hand over fist. Yep. So there's that. And then at the same time, you know, that's going to be like a set of companies and individuals that that would be focused on. We then also have to focus on giving that power somewhere too. And that means like actually thinking through ways that we're empowering workers, specifically like workers who've kind of been left out of things. So I'm talking about care workers and, uh, you know, 
uh, gig workers and, um, you know, hotel workers, folks who are, who are kind of like, you know, sort of the, the last folks that, uh, that, you know, people in Washington think about when they think about the labor movement. We got to make sure that those folks are the ones who are actually getting the power. And it's more than just like, you know, worker representation on boards. It's like, how do we get people paid money and health care and child care and um, all, all of these things uh, so that they can have a little bit more flexibility about like, you know, I'm, I have this abusive boss. I'm going to go to somewhere else. I'm going to go to somewhere else because my health care isn't tied to that. Or, um, you know, I can take off a sick day because I know that, you know, my schedule, the schedule isn't going to be so changed that like I can't get back in when I come back or something like that. So yeah, that, I think there's just like a power shine. I know this is sounding like it's like, you know, out of the middle of uh, Marx or something like that, no, but no, 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 kind no. of is, but like, you know, there's a power shift that like needs to happen between like, you know, the folks who are hoarding a tremendous amount of resources right now and like using them to do dumb shit, like, you know, go, go into space and like fo folks who are literally starving to death, literally putting themselves in harm's way and getting COVID and dying just to make our economy function. No, no, um, no, totally, we've got to start totally. shifting that power. Totally. I mean, that's such a good point. Look, and there's no, I mean, like, look, I think, I think the anti-monopoly movement in general is a market-based movement. Right. But I, but I don't, I'm not one. I don't, I don't have these boxes that I put this stuff in, in this way. You know, I'm not like, this is anti-monopoly movement and this is a socialist movement and they, and, and that's it. And like, those streams, right. those streams can never run together and never intertwine. I, I, monopoly movement is, you know, is, I look, obviously, obviously, I think it's deeply important because I think it, because I think it's ultimately a democratic movement and it, and I think that it does what you want to do in one way, which is not only to redistribute wealth, but also redistribute power. Yeah. You know, yeah, throughout the yeah, economy. Absolutely. But I think absolutely. there are other, but, but, but I, but I, but I, it's a tool kit. It's not a tool. It is a toolkit, and there are other yeah. and there are other pieces of it that can they, that 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 can do that same thing in different ways. Whether it's you know unionization, whether it's collectivization, whether it's taking certain parts of the economy that are that that you know like they're inelastic markets, they don't work very well as a market. You just got to literally remove them from the market and give them to the people. Okay, I mean these you know there are all kinds of things that can that I think kind of go into this brew of trying to um, make the economy and our politics, our political economy more democratic. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, when, when I hear some folks talking about like, you know, the solution is to just like get back to the trust buster days. Like, I think one of the problems there was like that they didn't do this enough, you know, like they didn't look beyond some of the core trust breaking tools into what are the what are the other tools we can use, and then what are the other parts of this problem that we need to fix so that like, you know, a generation from now or even ten years from now or whatever, we're not right back into the same exact situation. Um, and as much as I want to break up Amazon, I don't want to just be dealing with, you know, a million Amazons either. Like we got to figure out some structural fixes. All right, buddy. Last question, and then I want, yeah. and then I want to let you go. I want to let you go on with your evening. But I appreciate, yeah, yeah. you know, I appreciate all this time you're spending with me. I of really course, do. yeah. But, uh, but I was hoping you could you could share with us maybe in you know in kind of explicit ways the way that you see the fight against monopoly power and anti-monopoly, the monopoly movement, um, like intertwining with and structurally linked to the fight for racial justice and for equity throughout the economy. Because I think that, yeah. you know what I mean? I think that like, it's easy for you and me to sit here and to, and to chop it up about it and to, and, and to kind of, you know, see these connections. But I do think, and this is, and I'm sure this is not lost on you that in the long history of anti-monopoly in America, there has not, that connection has not been made. Oh, absolutely. It has not yeah. been made. And then, I mean, it's been, it's been, in some ways it's been the elephant in the room because it just has not been talked about. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, th- you know, I think the main, there's lots of different ways. And like, you, you know, if we had longer, we could talk about sort of, you know, Amazon supporting police and, you know, uh, helping to boost uh, white supremacists and Nazis on their platform and Google uh, helping to radicalize Islamophobes. And like, you know, there's lots of kind of little specific examples that you can, you don't see smaller non-monopolies doing that kind of stuff effectively because part of doing it effectively is having controlling amounts of market share. Um, But I think, you know, structurally, sort of taking a step back and structurally thinking about it, like there are like one of the ways that one of the things that having a monopoly allows you to do is to just take a bunch of shortcuts so you can speed your business up a tremendous amount. You can, you know, get labor faster and cheaper. You can source cheaper products. You can, you can so there's a ton of shortcuts. The people who end up paying for those shortcuts are almost entirely workers of color or producers of color. So, you know, Am- Amazon's work uh, warehouses are like, there's like a lot of people of color who are, who are have those jobs that you know, you see the commercials and they're smiling as they're, you know, stocking things on the shelves. And then you talk to the workers and they're like dying of heat stroke, you know, like peeing in water bottles during their shifts. And, mm-hmm. um, and you know, you get the smile box at the end of it. But what was behind that smile box was actually the pain of some black and brown worker um right. or you know facebook uh likes to talk about the technology that they have to moderate posts and and then when you start to peel it back it's like oh this isn't technology you're just using a bunch of low wage workers outside of this country to moderate your and that is like giving them trauma that will last a lifetime and you know so there there are all these shortcuts that they use and then sort of package as like this is a new technology or this is the new way to do it you know, Amazon figured out a logistics system that makes every, they can deliver everything in two days or one day. They didn't really figure out a logistics system. They just have a bunch of low wage workers who they force to move really, really, really quickly. There's nothing like, right. like you know what I mean? Like they're just like pushing this group of black and brown workers to the absolute limit. Um, and that's required in with monopolies. Like you kind of have to do that to be effective. So if we want to, you know, make major change in in how uh, you know racial justice works in the economy, we have to address how it works these huge titans of the economy, which are the monopolies. Um, and that just has a ripple effect. Um, you know, we see when monopolies are forced to institute something different companies that are in that might be in that field that are nowhere near to the uh, the size of that that company also implement it cuz they're like well shit I don't want to be actually you know like I don't want to exactly. get to there and then have to do it you know I um, was ju- I was just talking about that the other night and we were Yeah doing, I mean we were doing this, a prime day action and the monopoly power doesn't just stay in the walls of Amazon Absolutely it, it not it trickles out to to the rest of the industry and and conditions go down and down and down for everybody, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's, you know, it's 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 critical to the fight. I mean, like we, it's critical to both fights, you know, like if you, you know, don't really care about monopoly stuff at all, but you care about black and brown workers um, and black and brown families and black and brown communities, like having, um, you know, the freedom of choice of what to do with their lives, like, that is something that monopolies help to dictate. If you aren't really concerned with, you know, you're not, racial justice fights isn't your number one thing. Well, you know, without black and brown workers and the exploitation of race, these companies don't exist. Like they just are not able to grow at the same rate. They're not able to do all of these like secret technology things, which are actually just underpaying people with brown skin. Mm. So yeah, it's a, it's it's crucial to the fight that we make uh, as many of those connections as possible. Um, that's how I think about it from sort of like a structural uh, structural level. Yeah. Well, look, it's the right way to think about it. Um, and of course, Acres on the front lines doing the good work of like bringing those issues to the forefront, making those connections explicit for people. 
We're just following, you know what I mean? Like we like at ILSR and I think a lot of the other anti-monopoly movement, we're happy to follow your lead because y'all are just like, y'all are doing the real work and you are, and you are, you are making those connections. And it's incredible to be, um, to be a comrade and to be, uh, in coalitions with you, my man, it really is. So thank you very much. I feel the same way. I feel the same way, man. I'm really glad to join y'all and yeah, ILSR is one of our, our, our core partners and, Love working with you guys. I'm glad, glad, uh, glad you invited me on. Likewise, likewise. All right, it's Maurice BP Weeks, co-director at Acre Action Center for Race and the Economy. He's a good follow on Twitter. You can just Google it. Follow. I don't know. You have a complicated handle, so I don't know. <laughs> it's <laughs> Mo eight seven Mo eight seven. No, okay, it's not that complicated, <laughs> is it? Mo eight seven Mo eight seven on Twitter. He's a good follow. Also, check out Acre and all the good work they're doing. Thank you very much for coming on, my man. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, Katie. No worries. And Katie, it was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for hanging out with me. It was really, really good. Thanks. It was fun. I'm just ha- got to chill and drink a beer. It's not bad, right? It's you not only bad. chuckle at a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Down for it. Wish my uh, entire work day could be like this. Right. No doubt. All right. Well, let's do it again. That's it. That's the whole show. Thank you again for joining us. Always, always happy to have people come and hang out with us um you can find us on twitter of course anti-monopoly hh the hh stands for happy hour you can also find me on twitter ron knox ron ron m knox at ron m knox whichever whatever my handle is lord knows it's been a long week friends i'm i'm uh i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and uh uh and check out but come back next week uh we are going to be on with Danya rahendra the director of athena who was a total hero and was again on the front lines of this incredible, um, incredible um, struggle and uh, an ultimately successful push to get these crucial anti-monopoly bills through uh, the House Judiciary Committee. And uh, but Danya is going to come on next week and talk to us. Until then, stay strong, fight the power. Do not let your corporate overlords get you down. And we'll see you next week.